Hi, today I wanted to talk about climbing Lobuche Peak, which is just across the valley from Mount Everest. So you get a really lovely view of it at the top. And uh, actually, if you time it out right, like we did, <laughs> you get the sun coming up directly behind Mount Everest, which is super cool. Um, Lobuche Peak is located right near Lobuche Village, which is in the Himalayan region of Nepal. So as you can see on the map, it's way up near the, the uh, Chinese border, which makes sense since Mount Everest basically borders between Tibet and Nepal. So one thing that's rather interesting about climbing Lobuche Peak is that it is not like any other mountain in terms of approach. Like every other mountain, like, I don't know, even in the Tetons or something like that, it's a few hours hike to get back to where your base camp is. And, you know, no big deal. So, right, you're living in a hotel or you're staying with friends or you're doing whatever. And then you have like a one day trek or potentially even a zero day trek to get to where you're going. And then you climb the mountain. With Lobuche Peak, it was, we added Everest Base Camp, which was an extra day, but basically it was a seven or eight day trek to get to the base camp area of Lobuche Peak. And so it was, <laughs> it's, it's a rather extended um, approach. And that changes the entire equation because, of course, you have to carry all of your gear for trekking and everything, plus you have to carry all your gear for the actual climb, which is uh, significant because Lobuche is 6,119 meters to the east peak. So now we've done Everest Base Camp and we spend the night in Gorak Shep, which is the closest village to Everest Base Camp. And then the next day what we do is, so Everest Base Camp is about 5350 meters, 5360 meters. We come all the way back down to Lobuche, which is like 5,000 meters, so it's, it's losing about 500 meters. And then we descend even further down to uh, below Lobuche base camp, and so that's actually at 4,900 meters. So we've lost, you know, six, 700 meters in the process, which kind of sucks. <laughs> anyway, and then we have to go up this switchback trail that you can see pictured here, and that goes up to uh, kind of a, a, a little bit of a ledge climby sort of thing and there's a very little bit of climbing that you have to do and you get up over the top of a ridge and then you look down on this absolutely gorgeous scene which is a, a small pond lake at a very high altitude with the base camp tents there of course assuming you're doing it during the season and uh, so that is somewhere on the order of, there was a debate about this and we never got a clear exact indication, but it's somewhere around 52, 5,300 meters at the base camp area. And so we, we got there in the afternoon and spent the night there and got up about one o'clock and we ended up leaving about two o'clock in the morning for the actual peak itself. While we were at base camp, um, you know, it was, as with everything in Nepal, you have porters who are carrying a lot of your gear. We had people there who were cooking meals for us and everything. So it's actually, you know, in terms of carrying your gear, it's a lot easier than other mountains because you have somebody who's hauling all of your stuff up with you. So essentially what I did was I kind of got there, ate, met some people, had a nice time in terms of that. And then we just spent the evening packing and making sure that we had everything that we needed for the climb the next morning. So at about, like I said, at about one o'clock in the morning, we got up, we ate, we made sure we had everything organized, and then we headed out in the dark. Started just around two o'clock in the morning, and we headed up a, uh, at first it was a small switchback trail, and then it turned into a kind of a rock face, sort of, and there's not a lot of images of this because it was pitch dark at the time but there's these sort of um balds i guess which are kind of sloping granite style uh you know they're pretty familiar to mountain climbers but the issue with them was that at that time in the morning they were completely covered with frost and ice and it was really really scary to climb on top of them it was very very slippery we were not roped in at the time the fall would have been potentially fatal it certainly would have messed you up um and all we had at that point was just uh, trekking poles. We hadn't even gotten out our ice axes yet. So it was a little bit scary climbing on that part. And then a little bit later, we got to a crampon point, which is about the time when the snow started taking over from more exposed rocks and so forth. Put on the crampons, got everything organized. I got a few short GoPro video 
clips out of this, but unfortunately, it, like, the temperature was incredibly cold. It was well below freezing. Um, I, my guess would be minus 15 centigrade, somewhere in that range, and GoPro batteries, unfortunately, just do not work at uh, that kind of temperature. So I could only get like 10 second clips. So you'll see these little real short clips and you're like, why did you not record longer? And it's because I couldn't because it kept dying as soon as I would start. And uh, at, under the circumstances with us climbing and so forth, I couldn't swap out the batteries. So it was sort of catch as catch can as we went up. Um, anyway, you'll see a lot more descent images because I can actually, it was warmer then and I could actually get the images to, to work. As we were climbing, um, most of it was covered by fixed ropes. I had the ice axe out, but for the first time in my life, I got to use a jumar or an ascender, which is a thing that you just clamp onto the ropes and you go. And uh, so it actually made the climb pretty straightforward. It, during the morning when we were climbing up, it was very, very solid ice. And so the crampons were, you know, having to work hard to get the crampons to stick into the ice. Um, but with the, ascend with the ascender rope, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, mostly it was just going at that altitude. It's, uh, you know, definitely a challenge to go above 6,000 meters, certainly something I had never done before. And uh, fortunately I had trained, as other videos have shown, I've trained with this mask called uh, the training mask. And it actually seemed to have worked pretty well. It's, it's a good hypoxia sim simulator. So for us sea level type people, <laughs> it was a good way of simulating some high altitude stuff. With the seven or eight day trek to Everest Base Camp, there was a lot of acclimatizing time, so that was actually quite advantageous too. It would have been probably impossible just to walk out from sea level and start climbing at that altitude. So anyway, um, some people have asked whether we used oxygen tanks and stuff. No, you know, Everest and K2 and those things are way above 8,000 meters. This was just barely above 6,000, so just deal with it. A lot of breathing hard at the top. <laughs> There's not Everest. <coughs> now you're happy? Yes. Yeah, Very happy. Get down and we'll be super happy. Yes. <laughs> Always good. And there's base camp down there. And what that the panorama? Camp. High camp, sorry. High camp down there. The only camp we did, so it was base camp for me. <laughs> Whew. What a beautiful day, though. Just perfect. Wow. It was very, very thin air, um, but you know, and it was also extremely cold. It was amazing how fast I got uh, kind of a, almost I didn't get frostbite, but I could feel my fingers going numb very, very rapidly, like within just a few minutes from comfortable to very, very numb. Um, and fortunately, I was able to kind of put on a heavier pair of gloves and also switch my hands for the Jumar because the, the cold metal of the Jumar was very, very, uh, it was just seeping the, the heat out of my fingers. So anyway, around that time, fortunately, the sun started coming up. You can see some beautiful pictures here, of like the sun starting to rise around the valley. Uh, absolutely surreal <clears throat> view. It, it really felt like being in a painting, not even in reality. Maybe part of that was being at high altitude and having no oxygen going to the old noggin. But um, it was just a spectacular. And we got to the summit right around sunrise. And so we got to see the sun coming up behind Mount Everest, kind of right between it and you'd say it just kind of like popped up right in there. And it's an absolutely amazing view, completely worthwhile. You know, I wouldn't consider the mountain terribly technically difficult. I suppose climbing it without fixed ropes, you know, you would have to pitch out things and put in ice screws and so forth because it, it was a pretty severe slope. I think at points it was in the 70, 75 degree range. Um, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but it was, you know, it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty steep. So uh, it would have required pitching out things without the fixed ropes. But with the fixed ropes, it was pretty, just walk right on up. We climbed it. We we started at two o'clock, we ended, I think we got up there right around seven. So that took us about five hours. And then we stayed on the summit for about a half an hour, took a bunch of pictures, took a bunch of video, you know, <laughs> did our stuff. You can see a bunch of these things here. I, uh, while I was up there, I left a, a picture of my father uh, at the summit with the uh, prayer flags and so forth that you can see here. 
And I thought that would be a nice thing to do for him because he was the one who inspired me to start climbing. And uh, he always wanted to go to Nepal and never got a chance to. So <laughs> here's your virtual climb, Dad. <laughs> there you go. Dad, that's a bad place to be, overlooking Mount Everest, right there where the sun's coming up. This would be a really nice place to leave this for you. As far as once the sun came up, it became very comfortable. In fact, I had to strip off a, a layer of clothing. I went from the uh, um, puffy that I was wearing down a layer. But anyway, started descending, it was super fast descent. We started about 7.30 and I think we got down to all the way to base camp by 9.15. So, you know, hour 45. Uh, it was extremely rapid to get down. But <laughs> here's the thing. We got down and, you know, usually again, you get to base camp and you're kind of done with your climb. Well, you know, we had multiple days to get out. In fact, we rested for about an, uh, two hours and left around 11 o'clock and then had a solid, really hard three hour, mostly downhill, but you know, you're exhausted at this point. It was a, um, a three hour hike to Feriche and uh, that was the next village we were going to. Then you sleep that night and you start hiking again in the morning. So it's uh, the climb itself, rather than being kind of this like one monolithic thing, is just a piece of a much larger puzzle in terms of the Nepal trek. As far as my recommendations are concerned, I, I was going to say this shouldn't be your first peak, like technical peak, but um, this uh, friend, <laughs> nice guy that I met there, Charles, and you can see a picture of him here on the summit. He actually beat me up to the top. Of course, he's in his 20s, so what are you going to say? I'm an old man. Um, but he had never climbed anything before. He had no idea how to wear crampons or anything, and he just flew up there. But, you know, being in good shape and so forth. Like I said, it wasn't a particularly difficult mountain in terms of, like, you didn't have to know a huge amount of stuff. You just mostly had to be able to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, so anyway, it, it's, it really doesn't require that much technical expertise. That's obviously helpful. It does require a lot of physical stamina and uh, some mental fortitude because, you know, it's pretty scary starting out at 2 o'clock in the morning, pitch dark, going up this really steep stuff, don't know exactly where you're going, etc. And, of course, you're, the biggest thing is you're at this crazy altitude. So um, I thought 6,000 meters was, uh, you know, not too bad. I, I, we were up there for a half hour at the summit and then I started to feel kind of woozy a little bit and I, you know, I said, well, it's about time for us to go down. And honestly, rappelling is usually the most fun thing for me because, you know, <laughs> just letting gravity do the work and you're just zipping down the mountainside. But I think that um, I, the first couple of pitches of rappel, I was exhausted. And I think that told a lot on just how hypoxic I was at that point. Uh, I did, I had an oximeter, one of those little things you stick on your finger. And you know, you start off at sea level, you're in the upper 90s. And as we went, it kept creeping down. And I think the night before we left to, to summit the mountain, I was in like the upper 60s, like 67. And that was at base camp. So I imagine I was probably, you know, kind of well below the danger zone of 60, 62. I probably was in, my, in the 50s or so forth. So anyway, the good part about it is, of course, once you start descending, you go down fast since you're just rappelling and you start, you know, losing hundreds of meters at a time. And so I felt really good after, you know, two or three rappel pitches. But it is something to pay attention to because I got up there and I was like, yeah, I feel really good. No problem. You know, I was breathing hard and everything. But then suddenly just started to feel like a little bit off. And so it was, you know, my body was telling me it was time to get back down to a more comfortable altitude, which at that point was... 5,500 meters, it's like, yeah, <laughs> practically sea level at that point. Anyway, I, I highly recommend the climb. Uh, I have not done Island Peak. I know that's the other big one and it's more popular. My understanding is Island Peak is a longer endeavor because it takes longer to get from Everest Base Camp around to Island Peak. And then it's like really big ball. And so it takes longer to actually climb it too. Lobuche is, uh, as you can see from the pictures, it's a very compact mountain. It just kind of pokes straight up 
and so it's uh, it's a more efficient mountain to climb in terms of a schedule if you have a, a relatively tight schedule you can literally add two days to your Everest base camp trek so instead of 14 or 15 days you can make it 17 or 18 days somewhere in that range and you can do it without adding that much time whereas Island Peak I think requires at least a couple more days past that just to get to it and get a climb it. So, um, as far as what to do next, uh, Gelgen, my guide, <laughs> awesome guide, he suggested that we do Mira Peak, which is, uh, he said it's actually technically easier, but it's another 500 meters taller. It's about 6,600 meters. And it takes some time to get back there to get to the peak itself. That's another one of those, takes a while to trek there. But I think that would be fun to try. I'd like to start pushing closer to 7,000 meters if I can. And, but you know, that requires, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing in North America because Denali is only a few meters taller than what I climbed, although I know it's way more difficult and it's in Alaska, which makes it a lot harder. Um, but, you know, you either have to go to South America or that uh, Himalaya region to get the 65, 7,000 meter range. So we'll see. All right. Anyway, I uh, let me know if you're interested. I'd love to hear in the comments, like if you if you have climbed it or if you're interested in climbing Lobache Peak or other peaks in the region and what you think about that. And of course, make sure you like and subscribe because Lane and I are, I promise, going to get a bunch of videos out. I think we're going to do a day by day, sort of like day one, day two, day three of our Everest Base Camp trek. So you'll get to see a lot of uh, details about all of that that I just kind of glossed over to get to the mountain climb on this one.